When playing a game, it feels like you're moving your player around in a fixed world, but this is merely a very convincing illusion. In reality, it's actually the world that's moving around you. Every time you move your head, you're really moving the world in the opposite direction. Even the perspective effect of distant objects appearing smaller is applied directly to the world. In this video, we'll look at how this transformation is performed, and more importantly, why it makes sense to do it in the first place. To start, let's narrow our focus to two-dimensional games, where the rationale behind this choice becomes more understandable. Many 2D games have pretty big worlds. If the entire world were shown on screen at once, it would make it very tricky to see where your player is. Because of this, most 2D games opt to follow the player, always keeping them in the center of the screen. It appears as though the player is moving through a fixed world, which really is what the game is doing when it calculates physics and other game logic. However, when it comes to showing graphics, this is flipped on its head. The player is assumed to be the center of the universe, and the world is what's moving around. To see why this is the case, let's put ourselves in the shoes of the computer or console running this game. Since a screen is just a giant grid of pixels, our job when displaying graphics is to figure out what color to paint each pixel with. If we have some image, we can easily put it on the screen by copying all its pixels to a certain region on the screen. But we do need to know where exactly to put the image. To do this, it makes sense to come up with a coordinate system that lets you identify different points on the screen. One popular way to do this is to say that the center of the screen is 0, 0, and the top right corner is 1, 1. We call the top number the x-coordinate and the bottom number the y-coordinate. We can now identify points like 0 0.2, 0 0.7, or 0 0.5, 0.1. One convenient thing about this choice is that it will be the same for all kinds of screens, allowing our game to run easily on all of them. Whenever we specify a coordinate on the screen using this system, we call it a screen space coordinate, contrasting with the coordinates stored in the game for physics and logic, referred to as world space coordinates. Since the center of the screen is 0, 0, and the player is always at the center of the screen, the game will always ask the computer to draw the player at that point, even though the player is not considered to be in that position in world space. What has happened is that the game has applied what's called a transformation, that manipulates coordinates in such a way that the player's position moves from wherever it is in world space to 0, 0 in screen space. The same transformation can be applied to the positions of other objects in the world to see where they show up on the screen. We've now seen one part of the answer to why. We need to know where to put things on screen, necessitating the use of a transformation from world space to screen space. However, when we move to 3D, an additional benefit emerges that helps speed up the process of drawing graphics. In 2D games, images were the fundamental object we used to build the game's graphics. However, images by themselves are flat, so they can't serve as the basis for 3D games. Instead, the fundamental object in 3D graphics is the humble triangle. A collection of triangles forms what's called a mesh. There are many reasons for choosing triangles, but that's a topic for another video. Effectively, what happens when a 3D game is drawn to the screen is that each triangle in each mesh is drawn one by one, utilizing the point's x and y coordinates to know where on the screen to draw it, and utilizing their z coordinates to know whether or not they should be drawn on top of what's already been drawn. Similar to the 2D case, the coordinates need to be in screen space so we know where to draw them on screen. This reason is fundamentally why the world ends up moving around the player instead of the player around the world. However, the process of getting screen space coordinates is a bit complicated. A whole series of transformations are necessary to take all the points from where they are in a particular mesh, to where they are in world space, to where they are in screen space. Remember that this final step also needs to apply a perspective effect, so that farther objects appear smaller. In a typical game, meshes can be translated, rotated, and scaled in world space. They can also be affected by a series of such transformations, such as when forming parts of a robotic arm. Calculating each transform in series for each point we need to draw on the screen can get very slow. However, it turns out there is a way to combine all these steps beforehand. 
This way, we only need to apply a single transformation to do everything from simple translations to the final complex screen space transformation, all at once. This is possible because of matrices. If you're already familiar with matrices, you can skip to this timestamp. Matrices are helpful mathematical tools that let us transform points in a variety of ways. Importantly, multiple matrices can be combined together into a single matrix to speed up computations. Matrices are built to work on a certain kind of mathematical object called a vector. While matrices are mathematical descriptions of transformations, vectors are mathematical descriptions of points. By describing all the points in a mesh as vectors, we are able to transform that mesh by applying a matrix to all those vectors. A vector describes a point by saying how far to move along the x, y, and z axes to get there. There's somewhat of a duality in the way we can think about vectors. We can think of them either as descriptions of points in space, or as descriptions of movements to make. Mathematically, we use this notation to describe a certain move along the x-axis. We can notate a sequence of moves by adding them together. Notice that under this notation, x, y, and z are themselves vectors. They describe movements, or points, one unit along their respective axes. We've essentially made a new vector by mixing together different amounts of existing vectors. Let's now look at some other ways we can manipulate vectors. We can scale a vector by scaling each of the individual steps along each axis. For example, if we take a vector and make it step twice as far along each axis, the point it represents is now twice as far from the starting point. If we apply this to all the points in a mesh, we see that the entire mesh changes size because each of the points are now twice as far from each other. Notice how we could describe this transform by saying that for every step the original takes along the x-axis, the transform vector takes two steps along the x-axis, and so on for the other axes. Let's look at how we accomplish this transform mathematically. We'll take this vector, for example, and scale it up by two. Remember that this notation means to take a certain number of steps along the x-axis. Our transform says that for every step the original takes along the x-axis, the transformed vector should take two steps along the x-axis. This can be accomplished simply by swapping out x with 2x in the equation. Every step that used to be taken along x is now taken along 2x. The same procedure works for the other axes. Notice how both of these equations work to make a new vector by mixing together amounts of existing vectors. The original equation simply mixes together x, y, and z, while the other equation mixes together the replacements for x, y, and z defined in our transformation. Let's now look at some examples of these replacement vectors in actual video games. If scaling each step caused the entire vector to be scaled, what if we rotate each step? By rotating each step, we cause the entire vector to be rotated in a similar fashion. Again, we could describe this by saying that for every step the original vector takes along the x-axis, the transformed vector takes a step along a different rotated direction. The same thing happens for the y and z axes. Like before, we can rotate any vector by plugging in the redefinitions of x, y, and z. Let's again take a look at some examples from real video games. 
Notice how both scaling and rotation can be accomplished in complementary ways. Scaling is accomplished by redefining each axis to be in the same direction but with a different magnitude. Accomplishing rotation requires the opposite, where each axis is redefined to be in a different direction but with the same magnitude. This suggests a transform that does both of these at once. We can redefine x, y, and z as simultaneously rotated and scaled. Plugging these into any vector causes that vector to be both rotated and scaled, critically only with a single transform. Applying this to a mesh sees the same effect. In fact, given a bit of effort, we can combine any two of these transformations into one. Notice how we can get our previous result by applying the left transform to the right transform's redefinitions. For example, the redefinition negative 1z becomes negative 2z after we apply this scale. We can always use this procedure of applying another transform to an existing transform's redefinitions to get a new transform that combines the effects of both. What we have built is essentially a matrix, all it's missing is some snazzy notation. Since we're always redefining x, y, and z as other vectors, we can leave all the x's, y's, and z's implicit. What we end up with is just a 3x3 grid of numbers. We can also write the vectors as singular symbols if we don't care about the individual components. Always remember that this notation is really telling you what vectors to replace the x, y, and z vectors with, just in a more concise way. We notate applying a matrix to a vector using multiplication, with a matrix going on the left. We similarly notate combining two matrices with multiplication. If you work out the procedure for combining transforms we saw earlier, you'll notice that the operation works right to left. So A times B times C has the same effect on vectors as multiplying C by that vector, then multiplying B by that result, then multiplying A by that result. Let's quickly see what the previous transforms look like with this new notation. A scaling transform has zeros everywhere except on a diagonal. This is because we redefine x as a scaled version of x, y as a scaled version of y, and z as a scaled version of z. Rotation does not obey this pattern, so its matrix looks more chaotic. The combined version looks just like we would expect and we can arrive at it by applying the scaling transform to the rotating transform's vectors. For example, here's how the redefinition of x is transformed. Similarly, the redefinition of y. And then the redefinition of z. Now that we have this very useful mathematical tool, it's just a matter of figuring out how we can accomplish the remaining transformations with it. However, as soon as we try to integrate translation, we run into a problem. Our first guess on how to accomplish this might be to replace each vector with a translated version, similar to how we accomplish scaling and rotation. However, when we try this, we end up with a very weird transformation. For example, the vector at 0, 0, 0 is unaffected by this matrix because it takes no steps at all. In contrast, the vector at 2, 0, 0 multiplies our new definition of x by 2, becoming offset twice as much as we want. The general pattern is that vectors that have taken more steps become offset more than vectors that have taken fewer steps. What we really want is for all vectors to be offset by the same fixed amount. This is not possible right now considering whatever we swap x, y, and z with will be multiplied by some arbitrary number. In mathematics, the term arbitrary means that the number could be anything. Using only what we have defined so far, it is impossible to make the translation consistent for every possible vector. The solution turns out to be introducing a new axis called w, but to see why, we'll need to go on a bit of a journey. For now, let's say that we just want all vectors to take an additional step along x. Mathematically, what we want is to add x to all vectors we transform. To leverage the benefits of matrices, we need some way of using a matrix to add x to any vector we multiply by it. 
Matrices, by definition, let us swap out x, y, and z with whatever we want, with the drawback that it's always then multiplied by some arbitrary value. But what if we didn't have this drawback? What if we restrict, for example, the z component to always be 1? If we do this, then whatever we replace z with will be left as is, since multiplying anything by 1 leaves it unchanged. Right now, this restricts us to having only two usable dimensions, but that's a problem we can solve later. Notice now how we can replace z with x to offset the vector of one unit along the x-axis. We can use a matrix to perform this replacement. As long as we obey the constraint that the z-coordinate must always be 1, all vectors multiplied by this matrix will now take an additional step along x, in addition to whatever other steps along x and y they already specify. To ensure that the z-coordinate stays 1 for subsequent transformations, we simply ensure that our new definition of z contains a single step along z. Taking a step back, it seems we found a way to make translations work with rotation and scaling by using a three-dimensional vector to describe a two-dimensional position. Remember that this last note is because the z-coordinate must always be 1, meaning it can't be used to carry meaningful data. We can still perform rotations and scalings the same way we did before, just as long as we keep the z-coordinate 1. We can also still multiply matrices together to combine them. All this suggests that to make translation work with three-dimensional points, we'll need a four-dimensional vector. To this end, we stop restricting z and introduce a new axis, w, which takes up the job of being restricted to 1. This also expands our matrices to be 4x4 instead of 3x3. Three three. All the same logic as before applies. We're able to do rotations and scalings along with translations, all in three dimensions, thanks to the presence of w. Unfortunately, we do lose a bit of intuition here, since it's not possible to imagine a four-dimensional object without using some kind of abstract representation. I encourage you to pause the video and try out for yourself that this new construction enables all the kinds of transformations we've seen so far, and that the multiplication of matrices still correctly combines sequences of transformations. Finally, we have the problem of the perspective transformation. The farther away an object is from the player, the smaller it needs to appear. This sounds like we should divide our vectors by some value to make them smaller as the denominator gets bigger but matrix multiplication only lets us multiply and add numbers. To get around this, we add one final step to the process of transformation, dividing each coordinate by w. So far, the value of w has always been 1. This does not need to be the case during the final step, because no more transformations exist afterwards to rely on w being 1. Because of this, we can safely give w a value to divide everything else by. The reason we don't divide by z instead is that this approach lets us adjust the strength of the perspective effect, while keeping the z-coordinate faithful to its original value. And now, we have fully accounted for the wide range of transformations possible in 3D games, while only requiring a single matrix multiplication and a single division to take meshes from their original space directly to screen space. Modern GPUs are wired to run these two computations very efficiently. With all this, we're able to move the world around the player providing the illusion that the player moves around the world.